Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, John Ducci, Assistant Professor of Statistics and Electrical Engineering. Okay. Um, his work focuses on large-scale optimization problems arising out of statistical machine learning problems, robustness and uncertain data problems. Okay, uh, thanks for the chance to get to speak to all of you. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, privacy and uh, machine learning under privacy, things like this. Okay. Uh, Let's jump in. So I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of motivation. Probably you guys already have motivation for, pri for privacy, but let's just jump in. Uh, so suppose I wanted to release some kind of counts uh, of microarray data. So what's a microarray? Uh, a microarray is uh, uh, you get a big population of people, you measure gene expression levels, and you put little marginal counts. So here, you know, I've got gene one, gene two, gene three, and then you know, five people had gene one expressed, three people had gene two expressed in your data set, things like this. And you might think, okay, if I had a data set like this, I took everybody's data, added them all together and released just the, you know, total counts across the data set, that should be fine. Right, now suppose an insurance company comes and says, hey, I wonder if, uh, you know, this guy, Jim, or if, if John was in this data set of, say, very healthy people, okay? Uh, and we know that everybody in the nice study, say, had this, can you guys see the mouse here? Yeah, had this last gene. Well, uh, you know, if these were my genes, maybe I was in the study. If these were my genes, probably I was in the study. If these were my genes, I was definitely not in the study because I don't have, you know, this last gene expressed. All right, so it turns out, actually, Nils Homer, uh, who's a, a sort of statistical biologist, he, uh, he did this study and he figured out he could, you know, just based on data that the NIH was releasing, he could find people identify them in studies. And actually, this caused the uh, National Institutes of Health to stop releasing genetic data for several months uh, in the early 2010s, or just before 2010. All right, so that's kind of a little issue. Here's another uh, thing I read yesterday. Uh, so uh, it's a headline in the New York Times. Uh, it turns out there's a warrant in Florida that basically opens up all of your consumer DNA sites to uh, police agencies snooping around and trying to figure out are you in them. Okay, here's, a, here's, my, here's my favorite uh, privacy example. So you guys remember the Netflix prize? Who remembers the Netflix prize? Anybody remembers it? Okay, yeah, so Netflix said, oh, okay, we'll give a million dollars if you guys can improve our recommendations by 10% or something like this. Right, and so all these teams worked on it and it was successful and then, you know, it went so well, Netflix thought, let's do another one of these. Okay, we're gonna have another Netflix prize where we give you a little bit more data. All right, then this happened, right? So Netflix spilled your Brokeback Mountain secret. So there was a woman who rented Brokeback Mountain and somebody figured this out based on the Netflix data and so she got outed as a, uh, as a lesbian. Uh, and then uh, this happened. All right, so that was the end of Netflix Prize 2 because of, uh, because of privacy. All right, so there are all these privacy concerns that we have and they're growing. I mean, as you, you know, all of us have these in our pockets. These things are monitoring most of what we do. Their phone knows where you are. It knows who you're talking with. It knows what you're saying to them. You know, there's a lot of issues of what you carry around and what we can measure. So, um, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of motivation now for why we want to understand privacy. I mean, you have genomic data. You might use drugs or things like this. You have a lot of financial information in your phones. Uh, all sorts of things. But there's a lot of benefits potentially from being able to collect the data about you. Maybe this is, you know, we can understand the biological basis of disease. Uh, you know, if I've, I've, my watch has a heart rate monitor, right? So maybe by monitoring my heart rate, I can, you know, identify my doctor or something if my heart rate spikes. Uh, maybe I can get better epidemiological control. Maybe I can do better economic policy making. So sort of there's, there's, somehow there's these conflicting things going on here. And, and this is a thing that a lot of, that I and my group are trying to work on and understand. There's sort of two goals. One, uh, what are the kind of fundamental trade-offs between privacy and utility, broadly defined? You know, how useful can my data be versus how much privacy can I provide you? And two, uh, sort of part of understanding that is to actually develop optimal and useful algorithms for releasing information or discovering things while protecting privacy of people who say, you know, carry cell phones or things like this. All right, so, so the starting point in this, I think, has to be a question of, okay, how do you formulate what it means to be private? Uh, and this, uh, th there, were, there were, you know, 50 years of work on this, and probably around 20, 2006 is when this got nailed down. But I'm gonna give you kind of three plausible definitions of privacy. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So how do, we, how do we talk about privacy at all? Well, data comes in, you know, X1 through Xn. So these are like, you know, 
data of me. So I'm x1, and uh, Jason right here is x2, and Erica is x3, and all of this stuff goes in. It goes into what we'll call a mechanism. So this might be, you know, your hospital who's collecting the data, or Apple, or Google, or whomever. Uh, and then they release something. And so this mechanism releases some kind of set of statistics, or models, or whatever it's doing. Okay, so, so here are some plausible definitions of privacy. Definition one. All right, whether or not, you know, I participate in a study or send data in or something like that, the results of the study or the mechanism should be about the same. So then it doesn't matter whether I participated or I have no incentive not to participate because I don't really have much effect. Okay, uh, here's, here's a version based on sort of statistical hypothesis testing. Let's suppose, you know, there's a bad guy sitting there trying to figure out, okay, who's in this database? And, and let's say the bad guy knows everybody in the study except for the last person. Right, so he, he literally knows everything, and he's just trying to figure out, was the last person who went in that study me, or was it Erica? All right, and that's all he wants to know. Uh, and uh, we'll say that my mechanism is private if the bad guy can't figure that out, or can't figure it out with any reasonable accuracy. Uh, so e even given kind of the outputs and the results of the study or whatever data is being released, can't figure out who that last person was. It seems pretty, you feel pretty safe. Another version of this is, uh, you know, Let's suppose I, I have a 50-50 belief that the last person in the study was either me or it was Yuri, okay? And then after the study completes or after we release our data, actually my beliefs still have to be about 50-50. Like whatever information I get from the results of the study, nothing changes that much. So it turns out all of these things are equivalent or can be made equivalent. Uh, the nice thing is this present, prevents sort of downstream attacks and things like this. Like it, even if a bad guy knows everything about you and everything about everybody else in the study, he still doesn't get much information when you do the study. All right, so uh, it turns out this is the right definition. And this is the definition that makes all of these things equivalent and it satisfies all of these. And so, so we, what, what this definition is is called differential privacy. What it says is that this mechanism, this uh, way of releasing information is private if the probability that I release anything uh, doesn't change much when I change people in the data set. So basically, you know, I have one data set, which is x1 through xn, and then I change it by, say, swapping one person out, then the probability that the mechanism releases any particular bit of information doesn't change very much. It's bounded by this multiple of e to the epsilon. Yeah, yeah, this is, I mean, it, we, we require a little bit of math to do the, define these things, but this is, it turns out, completely equivalent to everything that we wanted. So that is these three, you know, whether or not you participate, nothing changes. Bad guys can't test whether you're in the data set, even if they know everything about everybody, uh, or your beliefs can't change very much based on what you observe from the mechanism. So all of these things are equivalent to this definition. So it's a pretty satisfying one. Uh, one thing that this definition does is it sort of presumes that there's a trusted curator you know, so if, uh, if you're carrying your phone around in your pocket, basically it presumes that you trust whoever gave you the phone and is collecting data on it to sort of aggregate your data safely. There are actually slightly more uh, secure versions of this, but anyway, but, but there's all sorts of work on developing algorithms under these kind of uh, restrictions. You know, we, we can estimate histograms, we can estimate rankings, we can do deep learning, kind of. Uh, there are ex all sorts of extensions. There's a ton of research on this in the last, say, 15 years. Uh, we can actually have stronger models of privacy, which is, I think, something that we want to be thinking about a little bit, and this is something that we've been working on. So a stronger model of privacy is the following. So, you know, there's me, the statistician or a policymaker or whatever it is, the machine learning person, and then there's you, and you have your personal data. And you don't know me from Adam, so you think, okay, I'm not sure I should trust John with my data. He's kind of creepy. So what you might do instead is say, okay, actually, before you even share anything with me, you make it private. You sort of obfuscate your data in some way. All right, and it turns out that this, uh, and, and, and then, you know, once you do this, then you're going to feel safe because no matter what I do downstream, you've already kind of guaranteed yourself privacy. Uh, and so basically, the definition is completely equivalent. Roughly what I say is that, you know, uh, if, if, you know, Erica is uh, giving me data or Yuri is giving me data, the probability that I can distinguish them based on what they show me is very close to half-half, just random guessing. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate to you the optimal way to actually do this for sort of answering simple questions. So here, here, here's a question, you know, have you ever smoked marijuana, right? So this was controversial once, I think it's legal in California now. I hope it's legal. My neighbors are constantly baking their house. 
I'm pretty sure my four-year-old is high. Uh, I don't know. They play a lot of video games over there, too. Um, but, uh, okay, so, 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 so have you ever smoked marijuana? And so, so I don't want to tell you guys this because I don't want you to know whether I've ever smoked marijuana in my life. But what I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is I have a, I have a die here, okay, six-sided. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this. And if it's a one or a two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer the question, John, did you eat breakfast this morning? And if it's a three, four, five, or six, I will answer this question, have I ever smoked marijuana? Okay? And even before I roll the die, I will tell you I ate breakfast this morning because I eat breakfast every morning. Okay, and now I'm going to roll this die. So remember, one or two, I'm going to answer, did I eat breakfast? Three, four, five, or six, I'm going to answer, have I ever, you know, smoked the kush? Right? I'm like Moses, burning the bush, right? Uh, anyway, all right, so here I go. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, so it turns out that if you want to figure out things like the proportion of people who have smoked drugs or, or, sorry, smoked drugs, done drugs, things like this, drink alcohol, whatever you want, that, what I just did, that is optimal. There's, there's, there's no other way of doing that this, that will give you better air. So that is provably optimal. That's a result that we've proved. Uh, and you, you know, that's it. Okay, so that's called randomized response. It's actually an old thing designed for surveys, but what we were able to do is show that this is unimprovable. Okay. Uh, all right, so, and you can ask me later. Don't, I, I mean, I guess one thing is, you know, don't ask me this question multiple times, right? Like, if I have to repeat this, eventually you guys are going to get it nailed down. But, all right, so, uh, so, so let, me, let me just now tell you a few things about uh, some of the theoretical results we've developed, and then I'll start uh, moving back to more kind of applied things. So, uh, remember that our definition of privacy is that, you know, if the, whether or not the data is X, so that's me, or X prime Erica, the probability that my mechanism releases any particular thing is bounded by this multiple, which is very close to one, at least for small epsilon. And so you might think, okay, so can we actually do estimation, learning, whatever with this? Uh, and it turns out that the answer is in this case where you're trying to sort of make your data private before anybody else can see it, it, it gets really hard. Uh, and so, so here's, the, here's a theorem that we've proved. Um, the theorem is the following. Suppose I want to estimate some d-dimensional quantity. You know, say the probability that, you, that you've done uh, marijuana, cocaine, uh, or a bunch of other drugs. Say I have like d different drugs I care about. It turns out that if you had a non-private procedure that solved this problem and used like a sample of size n, so everybody in this room, well, if you want to do this privately, at least, you know, making things private before a curator can see the data, uh, you're going to need d, that's the dimension, or sort of the number of questions you have, divided by epsilon times as much data. All right, so, so if you think about this, you know, if, you, if you've done deep learning or things like this, d, that dimension, is something like a million or a billion. So you're looking at like a million to a billion times more data than you would require if you didn't care about people's privacy. That's probably hard to do. Uh, so... Takeaway is, you know, don't do local privacy in high dimensions. That's actually going to be impossible. So you can't provide this, at least for most things, except for very simple problems. Uh, although, if you want to, I can tell you how to do it optimally. All right, so, so now let's, uh, let's move back to central privacy. So now we're going to say, okay, actually, you know what? I trust the people collecting the data because they're my doctor or it's Google or it's whomever. Uh, you know, so what can we actually do if I trust them, right? Or Apple. Maybe you trust Apple. I don't know. Uh, Paid enough money for the phone, I probably should trust them, right? Um, okay, so, so what can we do? So there's actually a lot of possibilities. So uh, in 2016, uh, I have some buddies at Google, and they actually showed that you can actually do deep learning with differential privacy if you trust them to collect the data. And, uh, you know, so here's the plot. You know, this is with, they set the privacy parameter to be two, which is sort of acceptable. And what you see is, okay, this is on a image classification data set. They can get to something like 65% accuracy. This is on CIFAR 10. Now, all right, they say we're going to do deep learning with differential privacy. Okay, so if we're being honest, uh, I can extend the graph up, and uh, that blue line up at the top is the state-of-the-art accuracy, which is uh, 95%. So, you know, they're only 30% off of the accuracy you can get. So whether that's a solution is a different question. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau actually is doing differential privacy, uh, and you can do this. Uh, and uh, Raj Chetty at Harvard is doing sort of doing differential privacy to actually try to figure out things like, okay, 
how do we understand social mobility in different uh, zip codes? And they've tried to make whole maps of you know, which zip codes actually incre increase or decrease social mobility. Here, red is decreased social mobility. Blue is high social mobility. Okay, they don't actually do differential privacy, but it's close. All right, so um, I don't have that much time, I think. Uh, but let me just, uh, yeah, I don't have that much time. Okay, good. Let me, uh, let me tell you at least one thing that we've done where we can show, okay, this mechanism is really optimal for uh, doing things in differential privacy, you know, because I want to actually develop optimal things to do. So let's suppose I want to calculate some function of a bunch of data. You know, I want to understand, you know, in uh, Salt Lake City, you know, how likely are you to improve, uh, to earn more than your parents? Okay. Um, so it turns out that the right way to do this is slightly complicated, but let me, give me, give me one second to explain it. So basically what I'm going to do is ask, okay, you give me this function and it has some value. And now I want to develop a mechanism that's going to release some other randomized quantity that should be close to the truth as much as possible. So what I define is what I'll call the length function, which is how many people would I have to change in a data set to change the output of the function I want to compute from one thing to another. Right? So if I have to change like 50 people to change the value of the function, well, that's a lot of people I would have to change in a study. So maybe that doesn't matter. It turns out that if you release data with a probability is kind of proportional to this length function or into the negative length function, uh, this is optimal. Okay? So essentially for any input, like any database you feed it, uh, it's going to maximize the probability of being correct. So this is a result that my student Hillal and I worked out recently. And let me just show you a tiny vignette. So I actually have all of the data on the salaries in the UC system, so University of California system, because uh, it's publicly available and you can creep on your colleagues if you want to. You're like, I wonder if they're getting paid more than I am. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, they are. But uh, so let's suppose I wanted to estimate the median salary in the UC system. And so this, this blue line is uh, what uh, some researchers who I won't name claimed was the optimal way to do this. Okay? And they're like, this is the optimal. This is good. All right, and, and, and on this horizontal axis here, I'm plotting the privacy they're providing. So very small numbers, lots of privacy, big numbers, not very much privacy. Uh, and their error, if they provide tons of privacy, is something on the order of, uh, what is that, $10 million? Okay, so the median salary is $20,000, so an error of 10 million is probably a little high. Uh, and then when they get down here, they're getting an error of something like $10 to the median salary. Okay, if you use the actual optimal mechanism, you're sort of like, oh, I don't know, four orders of magnitude better in terms of estimating the median salary at the UC system, which is $20,000. Right, okay. So... This is why optimality matters and why you actually want to be careful. When you say something is optimal, maybe, you know, mean optimal. All right. Uh, we had some other results about stochastic optimization, but since I'm out of time, so this is, we have ways to actually, you know, if you wanted to fit a big model across a bunch of, say, phones or something like that, I can tell you how to do that. Uh, but I don't want to waste your time too much uh, since we're running a little over and it's break time, you guys probably want coffee. So I'll just finish up with, uh, here are some references if you want to read some papers. Happy to take some questions, talk offline with any of you. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, enjoy the coffee break. You mentioned that randomized response was optimal. Yeah. When you say optimal, does it mean that there isn't a better way of doing this or does it mean that you can infer nothing from this information? Oh, I see. Optimal means that you have a particular privacy budget that you've set. You say, okay, I want my privacy to be at this level, all right? And now the question is, for all possible procedures that provide that level of privacy, what will give you the best estimators or the best ability to learn? So okay? it's possible that the level of privacy that's achievable is still not sufficient to meet people's standards, though. Is that fair to say? The, uh, I, I'm, let, me, let me try to ask this question back to you to make sure I'm understanding. So you're, you're worried that it won't be providing enough privacy? Um, I think that uh, the, these mechanisms, I, th I think like you can always set the level to be whatever you want. You know, if you set the level to be zero, which means perfect privacy, 
basically the data, like what you release is literally independent of the input data, it's just random noise, then you will get perfect privacy. Like, that's it. So you can always, there's always a level that you can set that will be satisfactory. Uh, and, and, but now the question is, you know, for the given level, can you actually solve the estimation or learning problem that you wanted to solve? And then we can tell you the answer to that because you, you can, you know, just calculate, okay, what's my error going to be? And if it's too high, well, maybe you need to trade off on the privacy or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. No more questions. Okay. okay. This may be taking us way far out of your talk, but... Um, Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, in the example, you're using you know, a centralized trusted providers of data. Yep. Could you just illustrate the things that we would need to think about in an untrusted environment or untrusted curators? Yeah. So, so there's a, there are lots of challenges when you have untrusted curators. And, you know, so I think that there are, there are a few answers to this. So different companies, uh, Intel, and then there's a few startups, are actually trying to build boxes, like computers, that provide sort of secure computing environments that will actually, essentially, so then if you trust Intel, then that box can certify that it's running the code and the methods that it says it's running. Uh, and so then, like, you know, whether, you know, whoever owns that box, you know it's running the code, it says it's gonna be running, and then you can kind of trust it. So that's like one possibility. Those are still not totally, like, they, they're not totally ready to run yet. You know, they're still pretty small, they're not super powerful. They'll get there. So that's one possibility. Um, if you don't even have that, then really the only option you have is basically to do these kind of local privacy things. So basically, I'm gonna, you know, you know, you don't trust me, so before you give me anything, I'm gonna hand you this die. I'm gonna say, okay, here are the two questions, you know. Did you eat breakfast this morning? Do you drink alcohol? Now roll the die, and whatever it is, you just answer the question that it tells you to answer. But I won't, you know, I'll close my eyes, I'll turn around, I won't see you roll it. And that's kind of it. it. You know, that's sort of, the, that's the kind of thing you can do, that's really all you're gonna be able to get. I think it's plausible there are hybrid models where you say, and I think you'll see companies moving more towards this, where you sort of say, okay, you know, we'll provide you a little bit of privacy but before stuff leaves your phone. We won't provide this full, like, hardcore differential privacy, but we'll give, there'll be sort of best practices that can be made a little bit rigorous about, like, what, what kind of protections they'll provide. And then once they hit the servers, like, at the company, you know, you'll be hitting either one of these secure boxes or something like that where they'll be doing serious, like, centralized, hardcore privacy. So I think you'll see these more hybrid models coming in the next two, three, one, I don't know how many years, six months beats me. Uh, but I think we'll see more and more of this as we go on. 